with reluctant heart withheld from publication this already concluded book. My obligation to those still living outweighs my obligation to the dead. But now that state security has seized the book anyway, I have no alternative but to publish it immediately. In this book there are no fictitious persons, nor fictitious events. People and places are named with their own names. If they are identified by initials instead of names, it is for personal considerations. If they are not named at all, it is only because human memory has failed to preserve their names. But it all took place just as it is here described. Content. Preface. Part 1 The Prison Industry. 1. Arrest. 2. The history of our school disposal system. 3. The interrogation. 4. The blue tax. 5. First cell. First love. 6. That spring. 7. In the engine room. 8. The law of the child. 9. The law becomes a man. 10. The law matures. 11. The supreme measure. 12. Higher that. Part 2. Perpetual motion. 1. The ships of the archipelago. 6. 3. 24. 93. 144. 179. 237. 277. 299. 334. 371. 432. 456. 489. B. B. Content. 2. The ports of the archipelago 3. The slave caravans 4. From island to island. Translators notes glosser. Names institutions and terms index. Ill U.S. Trations. Page 2. Alexander Zayevich Solzhenitsyn in the army in detention after his release from camp. Page 488 Viktor Petrovich Kodkovsky Alexander Strobinder Vasily Ivanovich Anichkov Alexander Andreevich Stefan Mikhail Alexander the three formats the Yelizaveta Yevgenyevna Anichkova. 633,565,588 Preface In 1949 some friends and I came upon a noteworthy news item in nature, a magazine of the Academy of Sciences. It reported in tiny type that in the course of excavations on the Kurima River a subterranean ice lens had been discovered which was actually a frozen stream and in it were found frozen specimens of prehistoric fauna some tens of thousands of years old. Whether fish or salamander, these were preserved in so fresh a state. The scientific correspondent reported that those present immediately broke open the ice encasing the specimens and devoured them with relish on the spot. The magazine no doubt astonished its small audience with the news of how successfully the flesh of fish could be kept fresh in a frozen state. The few, indeed, among its readers were able to decipher the genuine and heroic meaning of this incautious report. As for us, however we understood instantly. We could picture the entire scene right down to the smallest details. How those present broke up the ice in frenzied haste. How, clouding the higher planes of ichthyology and elbowing each other to be first, they tore off chunks of the prehistoric flesh and hauled them over to the bonfire to thaw them out and bolt them down. We understood because we ourselves were the same kind of people as those present at that event. We, 
Work from that powerful tribe of sex. You meet on the face of the earth. The only people who could devour prehistoric salamander with relish. And the Torino is the greatest and most famous island just. It's best time epic. Full of ferocity of that amazing country of Gulag which, though scattered in an archipelago geographically, was, in the psychological sense, fused into a continent and almost invisible, almost imperceptible country inhabited by the Zek people. And this archipelago crisscrossed in patterns of other country within which it was located, like a gigantic patchwork, cutting into its city, covering over its streets. Yet there were many who did not even guess at its presence and many, many others who had heard something vague. And only those who had been there knew the whole truth. But, as those stricken dumb on the islands of the archipelago, they kept their silence. By an unexpected tone of our history, a bit of the truth, an insignificant part of the whole, was allowed out in the open. But those same hands which once screwed tight our handcuffs now hold out their palms in reconciliation. No, don't. Don't wake up the past. Well on the past and you lose an eye. But the proverb goes on to say, forget the past and you lose both eyes. Decades go by, and the scars and sores of the past are healing over for good. In the course of this period some of the islands of the archipelago have shuddered and dissolved in the polar sea of oblivion rolls over them. And someday in the future, this archipelago, its air, and the bones of its inhabitants, frozen in the lands of ice, will be discovered by our descendants like some improbable salamander. I would not be so bold as to try to write the history of the archipelago. I have never had the chance to read the documents. And, in fact, will anyone ever have the chance to read them? Those who do not wish to recall have already had enough time and will have more to destroy all the documents, down to that very last one. I have absorbed into myself my own 11 years there not as something shameful nor as a nightmare to be sure. I have come almost to love that monstrous world, and now, by a happy turn of events, I have also been entrusted with many recent reports and letters. So perhaps I shall be able to give some account of the bones and flesh of that salamander which, incidentally, is still alive. Three days. Five. She. This book could never have been created by one person alone. In addition to what I myself was able to take away from the archipelago on the skin of my back, and with my eyes and ears material for this book was given me in reports, memoirs, and letters by 227 witnesses, whose names were to have been listed here. What I here express to them is not personal gratitude, because this is our common, collective monument to all those who were tortured and murdered. From among them I would like to single out in particular those who worked hard to help me obtain supporting bibliographical material from books to be found in contemporary libraries or from books long since removed from libraries and destroyed. Great persistence was often required to find even one copy which had been preserved. Even more would I like to pay tribute to those who helped me keep this manuscript concealed in difficult periods and then to have it copied. But the time has not yet come when I dare name them. The old Solovetsky Island's prisoner Dmitry Petrovich Vitkovsky was to have been editor of this book. But his half a lifetime spent there indeed. His own camp memoirs are entitled, Half a Lifetime, Resulted in Untimely Paralysis, 
and it was not until after he had already been deprived of the gift of speech that he was able to read several completed chapters only and see for himself that everything will be told. She, I, Rekha. And this freedom still does not dawn on my country for a long time to come. Then the very reading and handing on of this book will be very dangerous, so that I am bound to predict future readers as well, on behalf of those who have perished. When I began to write this book in 1958, I knew of no memoirs nor works of literature dealing with the hands. During my years of work before 1967 I gradually became acquainted with the Kalima stories of Varlam Shalamov and the memoirs of Dmitry. Vitkovsky, Y, Ginsberg, and O, Adam with a sly as birth, to which I refer in the course of my narrative as literary fact known to all, as indeed they someday shall be. This fight their intent and against their will, Certain persons provided invaluable material for this book and helped preserve many important facts and statistics as well as the very air they breathe. And, I, T. Rabs Lapsus, and, B. Belenko, the chief state prosecutor for many years, is their A. Y. Vyshinsky, and those jurists who were his accomplices, among whom one must single out in particular I. L. A verdict. Material for this book was also provided by 36 Soviet writers, headed by Maxine Gorky, authors of the disgraceful book on the white seeking era, which was the first in Russian literature to glorify slave labor. Part 1. The Prison Industry In the period of dictatorship, surrounded on all sides by enemies, he sometimes manifested unnecessary leniency and unnecessary soft-heartedness. K-R-Y-L-E-N-K-O Speech at the Party Trial Alexander Zayevich Solzhenitsyn in the Army In Detention after his release from camp. Chapter 1. Arrest. How do people get to this clandestine archipelago? Hour by hour planes fly there, ships steer their course there, and trains thunder off to it but all with nary a mark on them to tell of their destination. And if ticket windows or if travel bureaus for Soviet or foreign tourists, the employees would be astounded if you were to ask for a ticket to go there. They know nothing and they've never heard of the archipelago as a whole or of any one of its innumerable islands. Those who go to the archipelago to administer it get there via the training schools of the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Those who go there to be guards are conscripted via the military conscription centers. And those who, like you and me, dear reader, go there to die, must get there solely and compulsorily via arrest. Arrest. Need it be said that it is a breaking point in your life, a bolt of lightning which has scored a direct hit on you. That it is an unassimilable spiritual earthquake not every person can cope with, as a result of which people often slip into insanity. The universe has as many different centers as there are living beings in it. Each of us is a center of the universe, and that universe is shattered when there is a you, you are under arrest. If you are arrested, can anything else remain unshattered by this cataclysm? But the dark in mind is incapable of embracing these displacements in our universe, and both the most sophisticated and 3. 4. I. The Gulag Archipelago. The various simpleton among us, drawing on all life's experience, can gasp out only, me. What for? And this is a question which, though repeated millions and millions of times before, has yet to our tilde seat an answer. 
The rest is an instantaneous, shattering thrust, expulsion, somersault from one state into another. We have been happily...